Abandoning weapons, gear, and all self-control, the passengers leaped from the trucks in a wild panic. I knew that we were in for trouble, so I took good care to leave with my rifle in one hand and a box of machine gun ammunition in the other. I lay down in the gutter. The truck drivers and most of the other men disappeared among the houses. Only Mather acted like a soldier. Standing livid in his trailer and shaking his rifle at his running men, he shouted for them to come back. God damn you guys, he bellowed. You call yourselves soldiers. Get your goddamn ammo. Get your goddamn guns, you rascals. His men turned and came back sheepishly. Others followed them to other trucks and trailers. Mather threw gear at his squad with a steady stream of curses. I smiled at him from the cover of the gutter, where I lay full length between the high curb and the thick truck wheels. Mather was the finest squad leader I had ever had. Soldiers! he exclaimed, clearing the last cartridge belt from the trailer and looking down at me. Jesus Christ, I laughed. Looks like we're in for it now, I remarked. You said it. He gathered his men and marched them back to where his platoon was forming. An excited soldier with the white diamond of the 501 on the side of his helmet trotted down the sidewalk. What's going on? I asked, standing up. Kraut tanks, he replied. He pointed to the head of our convoy. They're coming in right on the road there. Jesus, we only got one battalion in town. Our flanks are wide open. Where's your battalion commander? In the rear. I jerked my head. Name's Colonel Strayer. He ran away. Another shell passed overhead and burst out of sight. Officers began to appear and organise their men. Our company having been cut in half, with company headquarters missing somewhere north of town, we were in reserve. D Company went south toward a canal at the edge of the village, while F Company began to go north where the tanks were. The British set up 40 mm anti-aircraft to fire down the side streets. We drifted off the main road, which had become the centre of enemy attention, and stopped in an alley beside a British truck parked near a wall. Squatted on the sidewalk, the driver was calmly brewing tea in a German mess cup as the shells zipped by. Hello, mates, he said cheerfully. Tea time. Getting rather warm here, don't you think? He stirred his brew. While Pace and Wiseman distracted him with idle chatter, Hubler and I moved to the rear of the truck, where we had noticed some loose rations lying handy. We lifted several cans of plums and stew and stuffed them into our musette bags. Wonder what's going on, I said, returning to the tea party. Does anybody know? Wiseman replied. If they do, it'll be the first time, Hubler added. Boost me on top of that wall, I said. Maybe I can see something from there. Wiseman and Hubler lifted me up. All I could see was alleys and backyards with nobody in sight. I wondered where the Germans were. See anything up there, Webster? A new voice inquired. I turned and saw Lieutenant McFadden, my former platoon leader and now commander of F Company. A small, genial, sensible person, he appeared to be as baffled as we were by our truck ride's startling end. No, sir, I said. I can't see a goddamn thing. He went away, and Lieutenant Peacock came and shifted us deeper in town. After passing more 40 mm, a row of dismantled 155 on trailers, and a Piat anti-tank gun crew hidden in a little round roofed bandstand in the middle of the village square, where several roads came together, we stopped in front of the village hall. Pace and I went inside for a personal tour, but since there was no food or drink, we sat down in a hallway and began to doze. I woke up with Raider shouting at me. Where the goddamn hell have you been? He said. We're moving out. Been looking all over for you. I ran through the brick tunnel toward a large air raid shelter in a field behind the next house where Matthews, who had my bandolier, and the rest of the first squad had taken cover, along with thirty or forty weeping civilians. I recovered the bandolier and started back. An 88 shell came in so close I didn't hear it until it was right alongside. I threw myself flat. The shell hit a wall 15 feet away, showering me with fragments of brick and mortar. Choking on the smoke and dust, I got up with my ears ringing and returned to the air raid shelter. Another shell passed by, and then a barrage landed on the main road where D Company had stopped. I did not return there with the bandolier. The first squad had crowded so fully into the little space left by the civilians in the shelter that I was forced to wait out the barrage half in the entrance and not fully protected. The civilians were unnerving. 
Clutching their children as the shells bammed into their neat homes, they wept and wailed, shrieked and moaned, and sang dismal old Dutch hymns. Some of them knelt and prayed aloud, as if the world were coming to an end. As far as we were concerned, they had no perspective. This was the safest place in town. Four or five feet deep, and with a roof of logs and sod almost as thick, it could have withstood a direct hit from an 88, which was more than we could say for most of the houses. I found the atmosphere so depressing, however, and felt so guilty about bringing this on the little children that I left in the first lull. Lieutenant Peacock was trying to restore order in the backyards. Nobody had been hit so far, and we were all in excellent spirits except Witzel, who had turned apathetic. Pace thought it was a lark, and Hubler made a joke out of every shell that went by. Morning passed into afternoon, with the road cut at both ends of town and no relief in sight. At one or two o'clock, almost a dozen Russian Air Force Typhoon fighter bombers appeared overhead. We waved and shouted as they circled above the Germans through puffs of light flak. One by one they peeled off and screamed down. Whoosh! They released the rockets under their wings at a target a thousand yards north of us. There was a wonderful sound of continuous booming. Several fires started to burn, and we hoped when the typhoons had gone away that they had put an end to the shelling, but it soon came back as strong as ever. We moved to an orchard by a crossroads on the northern outskirts of town and began to dig in as fast as possible. This was the front-line reserve position. The orchard was bounded by dirt roads on the west and north, the main highway on the east, and a cobblestone road on the south, where several houses were occupied by battalion headquarters and the aid station. The soil was light and sandy, though occasionally laced with roots, and digging together, one at each end, Wiseman and I went down to water level in about ten minutes. Our slit trench for we never dug one-man foxholes was two feet wide, six feet long, and four and a half feet deep, and none too soon. Jesus Christ, I exclaimed, jumping into the hole. They've seen us. The shells had landed on the cobblestone road. Rascals, Wiseman muttered. We looked up and grinned at each other. Here they come again. Sitting in an inch of water, I closed my eyes, gritted my teeth, held my breath, and clutched my elbows with my arms around my knees. Three more shells came in, low and angry, and burst in the orchard. They're walking them toward us, I whispered. I felt as if a giant with exploding iron fingers were looking for me, tearing up the ground as he came. I wanted to strike at him, to kill him, to stop him before he ripped into me, but I could do nothing. Sit and take it, sit and take it. The giant raked the orchard and tore up the roads and stumbled toward us in a terrible blind wrath as we sat in our hole with our heads between our legs and curses on our lips. I never felt so helpless before. I confided to Wiseman in a dry whisper an hour after the shelling started. I'd give a foot to get out of here. Three pounds of TNT a muzzle velocity higher than a rifle bullet, hundreds of pieces of jagged red-hot metal, black clouds of smoke, 88s, death. Three more came in. The Germans were firing in battery, probably from tanks or SPS. The last shell was so close that it clanged when it exploded. Three more arrived. The ground quaked and a rancid black thundercloud curled down into our hole, making us cough and choke. An ugly chunk of hot steel an inch square plunked into Wiseman's lap. He grinned. Close, I whispered. They're traversing the orchard. I felt as if the giant were near enough to hear me and I was afraid to raise my voice for fear it would draw him to us. Three and then three and then three. No wonder men went crazy in a shelling. It was the worst experience on earth. You could fight a tank and shoot back at an airplane and meet a man on equal terms, but there was nothing you could do about artillery. The Germans called it the whispering death. A man began to moan aloud in the southeast corner of the orchard. Medic, he called plaintively. Somebody get a medic. Somebody help me. God, oh God, I can't stand it. The next three shells came in so fast that their zipping sound was intermingled with the explosions. The giant grabbed our hole and shook it back and forth. I dissolved and waited to die. Each salvo had come closer. This was the closest of all. One of the shells had hit a tin shed ten feet away. The next three would bracket us. They got the third bat, someone shouted. They killed those third bat sergeants. Now it's us. I whispered. Buddy, 
Wiseman began. He shook his head. The next three passed overhead and hit the crossroads fifty yards behind us. Woo! I said, smiling. Thank God that's over. Now it's Strayer's turn. He can have it. Wiseman grinned. We stood up and looked out. The trees around us were chopped by shell fragments, and the ground littered with torn branches and frayed leaves. Black craters dotted the earth. Other men rose from their holes and greeted one another. While we watched, amazed, two Sherman tanks waddled out of town on the main road and stopped beside the orchard. We cursed them, because we were afraid they would attract more artillery fire, but not a shell came in. Toward the end of the afternoon, in another lull, Raider announced that our British rations, which were designed not for an individual but for a group of men, were available for supper. Come and get them, Hubler cried, standing near Raider. The hell I will, I answered. Throw mine to me here. Lyle, Massaconi and several others sauntered over to eat above ground with the non-coms. Wiseman joined them. I stayed in my hole. It's all over, Webb, Hubler chortled. Come on out, you're safe. The others laughed. God damn Webster's got hole it is, Raider remarked. 388 came in from the north and burst in the orchard. Six men tumbled into Raider's hole. Wiseman landed on my feet in a high dive. I glanced over the crumbling sandy parapet. Not a person was in sight. What did you say, Hubler? I called. Ha ha ha. The shelling commenced as heavy as before. Wiseman shared his can of beef with me. At twilight, our platoon sergeant, Talbot, began shouting in alarm. Out of your holes, men, he cried as the shells died down again. We have to go help F Company. Krauts have broken through, outposts driven in. Bring all your ammo. Let's go. Well, I thought, climbing slowly out of the slit trench, the shells will catch us above ground now. But if you have to go, you have to go. F Company's in trouble and we have to help them. We're in reserve, so we have to go. And if we're shelled, we're shelled. There is absolutely nothing we can do about it. I followed the other men to the north end of the orchard, where we gathered around Talbot and Lieutenant Peacock and began to wait. Lyle and some of the other replacements who had never seen a fresh dead man before drifted off to the left to inspect the remains of two sergeants from G Company, who had just begun to dig in when a shell landed between them. Lieutenant Peacock did not consider the site of positive value, and so he drove them from the scene and forbade anybody else to go there. Finally, we got moving. The dusk was ominously silent. Tensed for the first shells, we edged down a dirt road to the left into a thick forest where F Company was standing in a deep grassy ditch lined with tall poplar trees. Many of the tree trunks had been chopped by shell fragments. A 57 Manyama anti-tank cannon was emplaced between two small, half-timbered houses. The men at the gun and in the ditch had a hard, sweating, detached look in their eyes and no words for anybody. All of them stared straight ahead at a narrow field of high, light green grass and a lush forest fifty yards beyond where the enemy lay. We passed along the whole company and their unprotected left flank and learned that the outposts had withdrawn of their own accord and that a number of men had been killed by German tanks, including an old E Company man, bouncy little Lieutenant Smits, a breezy, popular officer from California. The second platoon's noisy Farley, however, had stopped a medium tank with a bazooka on the main road at a distance of less than 100 feet. Winding around to the left, we came out on the cobblestone road behind the orchard. Wiley, the big, mean cook whom Nikelski had beaten up in Aid Bourne before D-Day, lay dead beside a shell hole in the road, his body sprinkled with rubble and torn leaves. We returned to our holes as darkness set in and the evening's shells began to arrive. I was glad that we had gone to the main line of resistance. The walk had relieved the tension inside me and the sight of F Company holding firm had been immensely reassuring. The air turned cold and a light rain began to fall. Wiseman and I took our raincoats out of our musette bags and put them on and settled down for the night, each of us sitting in one end of the trench with his head on his knees. Our boots were wet through, and the rain and dirt kept trickling down our necks. We were so cold and miserable that we couldn't sleep, but as I remarked to Wiseman, we could thank God for one thing. What's that? he inquired sleepily. We're in reserve. The Germans disappeared just before dawn, and so we got out of our holes a couple of hours later and began to trail them. We crossed the main road, 
where Farley's Mark V medium tank stood 100 yards north of the F Company line and went down a lesser road to the east. The ditch on our right was littered like a dirty beach, with shovels, canteens, bayonets, musette bags and other abandoned gear. Hey, Whitsell, I said, there's a shovel for you. He had been borrowing shovels for several days, and if there was one thing I hated to loan, it was a shovel. Uh-huh, he mumbled, not bothering to stop. Pick it up. You'll need it later. He shrugged his shoulders and looked away. Raider, who had overheard us, made him get a shovel and put it on his belt. When we reached the open farmland beyond town, the column of British tanks that we were escorting slowed down while we spread out in skirmish lines on both sides of the road and began to move forward in search of stray Germans. Intermittent machine gun fire encouraged us to stay close to the ditches, but our platoon found nothing to shoot at. The second platoon's McClung, a tall, thin man with deep sunken eyes and a rather melancholy expression, had better luck. A remarkably keen scout, who was said even to be able to smell Germans, and who was therefore in great demand for patrols, flushed several enemy soldiers from hiding. He delighted the English tank crews by chasing the Germans in front of their tanks and killing them, frontier style. Everybody got back on the road in an hour or so, and proceeded in another direction at a brisker pace. A flight of C-47s towing CG-4A gliders on, a supply mission passed to our right half a mile away. As they came abreast of us, some Germans on the ground threw up a mass of light flak at them. Raider, Lieutenant Peacock cried. Take four men and knock out those Akak guns. Yes, sir. The column continued to march. Pace Wiseman Webster Hubler, let's go, Raider said. I stopped with the others beside the road and gaped at Raider. He's crazy, I said. Four men to attack all those Krauts? Hell, there's at least a company over there, probably with anti-aircraft half-tracks. They're half a mile away and nobody's stopping for us. Where's the battalion going? Does anybody know where we're going? A twinkle came in Raider's eye. You and Pace go look in that house over there, he said. He pointed at a big, half-timbered farmhouse about 150 yards down a tree-lined dirt lane to our right. An old brown barn with a thatched roof stood to the left. Our own road was lined at regular intervals with leafy poplars. Pace and I stopped near one of the trees, and lying on a dirt mound, looked up and down. Kraut tank, Pace exclaimed, pointing left. I squinted. You're full of it. Down in those trees about two hundred yards. Oh yeah, sure. A big tank camouflaged with tree branches sat at a crossroads two hundred yards away. That's a Sherman, I said, studying it. I wanted to shake Raider's hand for acting so sensibly. If we had attacked the Germans with their 20mm and 40mm cannon as ordered, we would have done it alone and unaided, and would probably have disliked it thoroughly. Lieutenant Peacock, who made no comment on our swift return, would have been miles away by the time the Germans had finished with us. I made a mental note to get out of his platoon as soon as possible. This is going to be good, Lieutenant Peacock informed us as we waited to leave the orchard again. We had returned to Vegel from the south and found it under shell fire from some Germans who had decided to cut the road there, despite the violent objections of the 327th Glider Infantry, who had come up to reinforce the village. No sooner had we settled down in our holes for lunch than the word came to move out. A British corps is sweeping up both sides of the road from Eindhoven, Lieutenant Peacock continued, driving the Germans before them. We're going to trap the Krauts men. We'll dig in near here and wait for them. A column of British tanks came forth to join us. When the second battalion was finally formed, we headed east into the country, then south to the edge of an immense plain where we stopped. Spreading out beside a winding dirt road, we dug into the banks of a deep grassy ditch lined with gnarled willow trees and began to camouflage the fresh dirt of our parapets with branches and torn grass. I'm looking forward to some good shooting, I remarked to Wiseman, who, as always, had dug most of the hole. An ex-miner, he was a better digger than me, with far more strength and endurance. He nodded and gazed out at the plain, which offered a clear field of fire for more than a mile. I don't see any krauts yet, he said, squinting. Me neither, but they'll be along and we'll be ready for them. Hot damn, we couldn't have a better position. I imagined the Germans' surprise as they ran from the British Corps and stumbled into us with no cover. It was a soldier's dream. 
After an hour, we began to get restive. No Germans had appeared, and there was no sound of distant firing to herald their approach. An enemy machine gun fired several hundred yards to our right and was silent. We slipped into our holes. The afternoon began to wane. What happened to the big deal? I wondered aloud. Snafu, Wiseman replied. Rascals are playing this war by ear. A jeep bounced cross-country toward us from the south. The man beside the driver kept waving an orange flag as a sign for us not to open fire. Limeys, Hubler announced, handing his field glasses to Pace. Take a look, buddy. Limeys, all right. Pace nodded. The jeep came into our lines to report that the British Corps was held up by stiff resistance farther south. We'd have to find the Germans ourselves. Christ, I muttered. Might have known it was too good to be true. The one time we get a good position, the goddamn Krauts refuse to cooperate. Hubler laughed and jumped out of his hole. If they won't come to you, you have to go to them. Come on, men. Up an atom. Spread out in a meandering column of twos, we started diagonally across the field. It was late afternoon already, with an overcast sky and a wet wind from the south that promised rain. We were in an excellent position to be ambushed, and the British tankers were not at all enthusiastic, but they were told to make the best of it and come along, because they had to go where we went whether they liked it or not. Trained in General Montgomery's leisurely tactics of massive preparation and overwhelming breakthrough power, they had no stomach for an airborne unit's hasty and impromptu manoeuvres. Another enemy machine gun fired to our right, farther down the road we had left, but none of the bullets was close. A couple of very young German deserters were flushed from the heath as we approached an oval-shaped pine forest about a quarter of a mile long with a big sand dune in front. Other deserters had abandoned their uniforms and loose items of gear in a ditch near the forest, Captain Nixon and an S-2 patrol ran across the field to our right. When he was in the column, Nixon began to show off his helmet and tell what had happened. On advance scouting, his men had bumped into some Germans. A machine gun fired a burst that hit him in the helmet, leaving a jagged hole, but nobody had been hurt. Cutting onto a sandy road that ran behind the little forest on the south, the lead tank went behind the dune, which was about 12 feet high and dotted with the light growth of a sand dune at the beach, and out into the open. Suddenly it stopped with a loud thump and began to smoke. Nobody got out. Krauts! A machine gun burped. The bullets crackled in the pines. Get some men on that sand dune, yelled Captain Winters, our company commander. A big, strong young man with sandy hair, he had won the Distinguished Service Cross in Normandy. The first squad scouts, McCreary and Little Mats, a quiet boy with thick glasses, went around the west end of the dune and into a ditch beside a road there, and suddenly came face to face with a terrified young German in a hole. McCreary stopped, and looking beyond, saw another German covering him with an MG-42. He could have shot the first man, but he knew better, for the machine gunner would have gotten both him and Mats. He whirled around and ran behind the dune. The first German popped out of his hole and ran in the opposite direction. The twilight thickened and rain began to fall. F Company and E Company lined up on the crest of the sand dune and at the north edge of the pine woods and began to shoot across a meadow at a cluster of farm buildings 400 yards north. A German machine gun returned the fire, bringing the marksmen to their bellies and moving them behind trees. The bullets crackled overhead as we ran up to join the shooting. Lyle and Massaconi threw themselves flat. That's okay, fellas. Hubler said, trotting forward. They can't hit you. You have the dune for cover. McCreary came back and suggested spraying the ditch where he had been, but most of the men were more interested in shooting up the farmhouse and a small forest nearby. Cease fire, goddammit, cease fire, a voice cried. We frowned over our shoulders. Somebody was always trying to spoil our fun. Now it was Lieutenant McFadden. Cease fire, he screamed, running up and down the line. That's the third battalion over there. Pass the word along to cease fire. Boy, what a mess. Tell that goddamn tank to cease fire. The shooting spluttered and died out in random shots. Someone threw an orange smoke grenade into the meadow, while Sergeant Talbot mounted the crest of the dune and began to wave an orange panel back and forth. Burp. Talbot scrambled down to the low ground. Third battalion, hell. Shoot those rascals. We opened fire again. Lieutenant McFadden unlimbered his ML and joined in. 
the second British tank commenced shooting its turret machine gun at the farmhouse. Since nobody shot back, the men quickly lost interest and gradually ceased fire as darkness set in. An all-around defensive was organised in the manner of a wagon train halting for the night in Indian country, with E Company on the west and part of the south side of the forest and the other companies circling the rest. Kneeling in the open beside the sandy road on the south, I tried to dig in. The roots were so thick and the ground so hard that I soon lost interest. Oh hell, I thought, putting my shovel back in its case. Why bother? They're not going to shell us. A whistle blew and there was a tremendous burst of fire near the dune for several seconds, then absolute silence. Wondering what had happened, I glanced to the west and saw the first tank glowing dull red in the wet darkness. Its ammunition snapped and crackled and popped. A smell of burning flesh mingled with the odour of gunpowder. Anybody want to go on patrol? I looked up at Talbot, who had just come into the area, and shook my head. Not me, I muttered. I don't volunteer for anything. Hubler and all the replacements stood up. We'll go, Hubler said. OK, come on. They followed Talbot through the dripping trees to company headquarters. I felt small and cowardly as I watched them go. Deep inside, however, was a warmer feeling. Self-preservation. Everybody but Hubler came back in a few minutes. In relieved tones, Lyle explained what had happened. We thought it was just a first platoon patrol, he said, lying down. Hell, it's a battalion patrol. Why should we volunteer? God damn right, Massaconi said. What's it for? I inquired. Well, it's an S2 patrol, Lyle began rapidly. They can have it, I interrupted. When are those stupids going to start making their own patrols? Anyway, Captain Nixon wants to send a combat patrol over to the farmhouse to knock out a couple of SPs that he thinks are hiding there. Not for me, I murmured, shaking my head. Me neither, Pace agreed. He was squatting nearby in wet misery, looking very small and forlorn. So we backed out. Hubler's going. He would. He's crazy. Lyle brightened. Remember all that shooting a while back? Yes? Well, the rumour is that Captain Winters wanted to send D Company across the field with all the bazookas in the battalion, firing as they went, while F Company gave him overhead fire. All right, that's what the shooting was about, but D Company told Winters to go to hell. If you want to cross that open field, Captain Macmillan says, use your own goddamn men. I laughed. Well, anyway, it's a good story. Never spoil a good story. Hubler returned and began to prepare for the patrol. He put on his wool-knit cap, rubbed dirt into his face and on the backs of his hands, and borrowed a Thompson from Little Mac of the Mortar Squad. Filling his pockets with clips of bullets, he tried to keep up a running chatter, but his voice broke, his hands trembled, and he began to stutter. It was the first time I had ever seen him show fear, and I admired him very much for forcing himself to go along. The rain thickened, soaking through my boots and pants legs. When the water began to work down my neck, I got up and moved back among the pine trees and lay down. The tank continued to glow red-orange. Unable to sleep, I got up and paced back and forth to keep warm. A sound of snoring filled the forest. How can they do it? I wondered, envying anybody who could sleep on the ground on a night like this. Hey, Webb, a hoarse voice called from behind a thick pine tree. I stopped and looked down. It was Wiseman. Cold and wet, he huddled on the ground with his knees up against his chest and his teeth chattering. Can't sleep, huh? Never could in the field. I sat down beside him, and since neither of us could sleep, we decided to kill the night with talk. After a couple of hours, we got up and went deeper into the woods, where we stumbled on the medics in a little drawer, begging four blankets off them, for they always carried plenty for the wounded men. We lay down and went to sleep. Cold and cramped and stiff all over, we returned to the squad at sunrise. Hubler reported that the patrol had gone to the farmhouse and found nothing, the Germans having pulled out in the night. Lieutenant Welsh, the company executive officer, now bade us rise and follow him. Going beyond the burnt-out tank, which still gave off heat, we came to a highway where a convoy of British trucks had been ambushed. Scattered dead men were still at the wheel, others sprawled face down in the road, where they had been caught trying to run away. The Germans who had killed them had dug into the roadside ditch on the east. Two or three of their rifles lay near their narrow slit trenches, 
and the machine gun that had covered Matts and McCreary was still in position on the lip of another. Its owner had vanished. Filthy as ever, the Germans had left behind them piles of ordure and a rank body odour that seemed appropriate to their long, oily hair and sweaty uniforms of cheap wool. Lieutenant Welsh was particularly anxious to salvage a Volkswagen Jeep that he had spotted in one of the English trucks. Close examination showed it, however, to be hopelessly out of commission, and so we contented ourselves with other souvenirs. Hand-knitted Shetland sweaters, thick grey socks, clean handkerchiefs, an armoured corps black beret, and a late captain's jacket, complete with pips and campaign ribbons. Apparently the Germans had taken all the food and cigarettes, because none was to be had, not even on the dead men. Never able to touch a body or go through the pockets of a corpse, I left that part of the search to less inhibited persons. The time had come to go again. We ran back to the company and set off in a battalion column, heading west. We crossed the road and, entering a small forest, came upon a strange and chilling tableau. His hands raised almost in prayer. A very young American paratrooper knelt in death beneath the trees with the bodies of two giant German paratroopers face down before him. A murmur ran through the company as it passed by. The American, who was from the 101 seat, was covered with bloody spots, probably caused by a long burst from a machine pistol, and it was remarkable to everybody that he had frozen kneeling in death instead of falling over backward. Who was he? we wondered, and how did he come to die here alone? Who had killed the Germans? No GIs had fought in this area before. The site provided conversation for a long time afterward, as we crossed a line of sand dunes and many meadows and continued on our way. We skirted Vegel and went five or six miles north to the village of Uden without seeing any live Germans. Our great plan of entrapment was over. Why are you digging so deep? A company headquarters man inquired. Because I just came up from Vegel, I replied. Oh? The stranger went away and began to expand his own hole, which was about six inches deep, while Janovec and I dug down and down and down. When we were almost five feet below ground, we widened the trench so that we could lie side by side on the bottom. We got straw from a haystack on the outskirts of town and put it on the floor as a mattress, then laid logs, branches, brush and sod on top. The company headquarters men, who had gotten through to Uden after the Germans attacked Vegel, couldn't understand why everybody else dug so deep. There had been no shelling in Uden. When our hole was completed, we lay down for a nap. Crumbling sand dripped on us as the walls gradually dried, and a light rain came in the open end, but we were mightily pleased with our new home. Webster, Lieutenant Peacock called down just as I was falling asleep, get up and come with me. Yes, sir. I followed him through the apple orchard where D and E companies had dug in east of Uden, and along a lane from the orchard to the Eindhoven Arnhem Highway. A large farmhouse and its outbuildings stood on one side of the lane, and a thick hedge on the other. In the holiday spirit of men in reserve, a squad of riflemen passed us with helmets in their hands, on their way to a pump farther down the lane which was our sole source of water. The pump squeaked and hissed and gurgled as a man from D Company worked its long, curved handle. Lieutenant Peacock turned left and with his farmer's stride swung down the highway past a line of British tanks and armoured cars parked at the curb. He went into a three-storey house on the village square, led me upstairs, and stopped in the second-floor hall. This was sacred territory the officers billets, and feeling rather like a slum child in the Waldorf Astoria, I looked around in envy, for their beds, blankets, sheets and hot and cold running water were beyond anything I could ever hope to achieve. My hole, which I had thought so splendid, paled by comparison turning to me with the look of a timid, over-conscientious man trying to be firm and decisive, Lieutenant Peacock pointed to a broom resting against one wall. Sweep it out, he said. Yes, sir, I replied. Boiling mad at my new role of scullery maid, I took the broom and flailed it against the floor to work off my anger. Officers, I thought, how I love them. I will be a scout and go ahead and on flank guard and run across the open fields with no cover, because these things are expected of any soldier. I will salute when I have to and stand at attention and say, yes, sir, no matter how wrong the officer may be, because that too is the army, and we all have to be disciplined, for without discipline you cannot fight. 
But when an officer who is sleeping indoors between sheets gets me out of a hole in the ground to sweep his house well, that's asking too much. The officers ate on tablecloths with waiters and a wine list on the troop ship when we came overseas, then came below to our tiny, sweaty steerage mess hall and stood over us shouting, Hurry up, men! Hurry up! There's another company waiting to get in. I didn't like that either, nor did I like their seizing the Blue Board, the best pub in Aidbourne, and putting it off limits to their own enlisted men, allowing all others to come in. That was a rotten, unfair abuse of their rank and privileges. They got away with it because who were we? We had no rights and no way to protest. They said they were right and we were wrong, and that was that. Yes, I will endure all the miseries of a world at war. Why do they have to aggravate them by demeaning a man? Aren't they happy with their jump pay? They get fifty dollars more a month jump pay than we do simply because they are officers and for no other reason. Their risk is no greater than ours. Many of the sergeants are better jump masters. How could anybody be an enlisted man in the regular army and put up with this crap for thirty years? Only a bum, a broken man could do it. I would sooner starve to death in civilian life than be an enlisted man in the regular army. And as long as I live, I will never sir another man again. These things I kept to myself, of course, for Peacock had me, and besides, I was young and cowed by rank and never sufficiently self-confident to be outspoken with officers. A real man like Wiseman or Blackie Wilson, the Oregon lumberjack in F Company, or Barnson, the wild and woolly, scar-faced Swede, who had been transferred from F Company after he threw down his rifle in a company formation at Fort Bragg and told off his platoon leader, these men would have told Peacock where to put his broom. They would have been thrown out of the company the next day, but at least they would still have their self-respect. They were men. I was a boy still. Peacock sensed it and knew that I wouldn't have the courage to rebel against him. Brooding on these things, I grew more and more angry, as he stood over me and picked and nagged while I banged around in throttled fury, I consoled myself by remembering what he was like in action and thinking that I was better. You could forgive almost anything of an officer who was good in action. If he wasn't good there, then he wasn't good anywhere. I returned to the orchard in a violent sulk, washed my face in the pump's icy water and filled my helmet for shaving. After proclaiming the great injustices that I had suffered to a grinning group of men cleaning the machine gun, I shaved and went back into Uden to be by myself for a few minutes. Saluting all the officers that I met, I strolled through the streets until I came to a bar. I went in and found a number of British soldiers seated quietly at little round tables, drinking watery wartime beer. The room was as neat and clean and warm as a Vermeer kitchen, it took me away from the army to the Europe that I had always wanted to see, the old country of peacetime. Glad to be a whole man again, alone and on my own, I ordered a beer and sat down at an empty table. I lingered in the bar till twilight time, then strolled back to the orchard for supper, which the cooks, who had just caught up with us, prepared from British rations, stray cows and other gleanings of the countryside. I decided to take a shower when this was over. The night was clear and frosty the stars very low and winter bright. Standing naked by the pump while another man worked the handle, I soaped myself off and rinsed the goose pimples. I had not washed all over for about ten days, and the feeling of cleanliness was like a rebirth. Murmurs of men in their holes in the orchard and in the farmhouse reached me as I went back up the lane, breathing deeply and relaxed and smiling inside. Looking up at the stars and thinking of the men around me who made up the regiment, I gave thanks that I was young and alive, outdoors in a fine country with an outfit that I liked. The peacocks, actually, were few and far between. For this I was also grateful. I was belabouring peacock with a broom, bam, bam, bam. He cowered in a corner and covered his head with his hands and cried for mercy. The thrill of the blows warmed my heart and made me increase the pounding. Get up, Webster! Someone cried. Peacock vanished, and in the darkness I saw Janovec sitting beside me, and heard Raider at the entrance to our hole. Oh Christ, I muttered, shaking my head. The dream had been so delightful. You and Janovec fall out in the lane in ten minutes for a patrol, Raider said. Okay, okay. Resenting the disturbance of my dream and feeling quite imposed upon, I took my own sweet time about putting on my boots, which I always took off at night, and stripping my cartridge belt. 
I did not relish the patroi, but because it had come up so suddenly and I had had no time for prolonged forebodings, I was not particularly scared. I fell out on the lane to find everybody else ready, and Raider mad because I was so late. After he had given me the usual hell for being late, he marched us out to the main road. Lyle and Wiseman had also been chosen. We entered the battalion headquarters house, went upstairs to a bare room and sat down with some other men from E Company and two S2 men who were supposed to lead us. They seemed quite unconcerned. Nothing to it, one of them said as everybody began to smoke. Captain Nixon, a blasé young man who made quite a thing out of being a Yale man I never let on, I went to Harvard arrived after we had waited about fifteen minutes. A dark person with a heavy beard, he looked as if he hadn't shaved for at least three days. This was his usual state. Captain Nixon was alleged to hail from a place called Nixon, New Jersey. His family was supposed to own half the town. Tension, shouted one of the S2 men, springing up. I started to rise reluctantly from the floor, where I had been chatting with Wiseman and Lyle, but the captain raised his hand and told us to be at ease. I sagged down again. Come in here with me, men, the captain said, leading the way into the adjacent room where a map was tacked to the wall. We followed him. My fears had increased greatly in the wait. I began to sweat and swallow hard. Captain Nixon, who slouched and never raised his voice, oriented us by pointing to the location of Uden on the map. The Dutch underground has told us that the Krauts have moved into the village of Volkel near here, he said. His finger went south along the Eindhoven road, then cut east to a cluster of eight or ten houses almost three miles from Uden. We marched down the highway at top speed and in closed ranks. Most of the men, including those from three, two, took no great pains to walk quietly. I began to wonder what kind of patrol this was. Either S2 knew something that we didn't, or else they were naturally careless. As for the others, most of them fitted the latter description naturally careless. They always marched with slung rifles until fired upon, and seldom took the precaution to be prepared for eventualities. I erred in the other direction. I was too apprehensive. Fearful of the night, which was cold and overcast, with low black clouds, I held my rifle ready and walked with care, looking all around as we went. I didn't trust S2 or anybody else to look after me. We stopped abruptly after we had gone about a thousand yards and knotted together at the edge of a bridge over a narrow creek ten feet wide. Two slit trenches were dug into the shoulder of the road on our side, with a machine gun crew in one and a bazooka team in the other. A telephone wire ran back from the position to Uden. This was the last outpost. The men on guard were very tense and quiet. They chided our leader for his loud and careless approach and told him to be more silent when he crossed the creek. Four miles from here to Vegel, one of them whispered. Christ knows how many krauts are in between. Lock and load, our leader told us, and spread out. Five yards between men. Let's go. We crossed the bridge to no man's land. A string of tracers flew into the sky parallel to us a mile or two away in the east, and then an artillery barrage rumbled and flared far off to the west. The sound of our shuffling footsteps and clicking gear became unbearably loud, but on we went as fast as before. The man ahead of me suddenly turned left. I stumbled after him into a slimy ditch, up a mound, and over a meadow of high, wet grass to a barbed wire fence, where I ripped my pants and cursed the day that I had thrown away my wire cutters. Never having used them in Normandy, where hedges took the place of fences, I had abandoned them in Aidborn. Now I needed them more than ever, for there were no hedges in Holland, just an endless succession of barbed wire fences. Watch the wire, I whispered to the man behind me. He groped for it and held it down while I ran to catch up with the others. This is a ball, Lyle remarked aloud. Shh! Christ! We scrambled up the loud stones of a railway embankment and down the other side, where we stopped for a ten-minute break. From here we went across several fields to a cow path through a dense thicket. The noise of our approach was so great that I expected to be fired upon any minute. Emerging from the tunnel, we saw a group of small houses about 150 yards away. We stopped and lay down while our leader reconnoitred the dwellings from a safe distance. He was back in a few minutes, without ever getting close to the village. OK, he whispered. Let's get out of here. No krauts around. 
We turned and hurried safely home to our holes in the orchard. Hit it, hit it, Raider cried. Hubba, hubba, put on all your gear and fall out on the double. We have to go down to best and help the deuce. Krauts have broken through. Enraged at the sudden awakening, for I had only been asleep two hours, the patrol having returned at about 1am, I decided to express my indignation with tardiness, which I knew was more irritating to Raider and Peacock than anything else I could do. I dressed slowly and climbed out of my hole to put on my boots. Everybody else had gone. Jerking the laces tight, I slipped under my harness and ran after the platoon, which had lined up in the lane. Always late, Raider commented. God damn it, Webster, when are you going to be on time? When this freaking outfit does something sensible. You'll never see the day, Pace said. I laughed. Moving out, Lieutenant Peacock yelled. Let's go. Nobody was very happy about it. Bleary and disgruntled, the whole company muttered and shuffled through the darkness. Best was, we knew, fifteen or twenty miles to the southwest. We could expect a long hike, since someone else was using the GI trucks that had left us in the ambush at Vagel. The column stopped and started, waited ten or fifteen minutes, and finally worked into position with the rest of the battalion. A number of men were smoking and lighting cigarettes. Nobody made any effort to put them out. We began to march, then stopped again near the British tank on the outskirts of town. The peculiar throbbing of German airplane motors came in low from the north. Its machine guns opened fire, putututututut, as it passed overhead, a strange black shape soon lost in the night. Put out those goddamn cigarettes, an officer cried. The smoking ceased, and the line began to move again like an unfolding accordion, as each man passed the word back to observe a five-yard interval. There were no tanks with us this time, for the British had drawn most of them north in a violent effort to break through to the paratroopers trapped in Arnhem. A flare burst low in the east a couple of miles away, and an enemy machine gun fired a long string of tracers under it parallel to our course. A drum barrage rolled and thundered miles off in the west. The shells lit the horizon with quick white flashes. Their explosions came to us faintly fifteen or twenty seconds later. A battle was in progress in the direction we were going, and we did not look forward to joining it. The pace was so fast, however, that we had little energy for forebodings. We kept changing off on the machine gun, each man carrying it twenty minutes on his shoulder, then passing it to the man behind him, and we were so burdened with boxes of ammunition that we were very tired by the time we reached Vegel. In the bitter, frosty cold of first light, the village looked like a Kerr E.B. lithograph of First World War ruins, Many of the houses had been shelled and gutted. Mortars had blown the tiles and lathing off many roofs, and eighty-eights had punched holes in the walls. The trees were torn, the windows smashed, telephone wires dangled from their posts. Now occupied by the 327th Glider Infantry Regiment, which had landed by air the day after we had jumped, Vagel had apparently been considered a key position, with bridges over a creek and a small canal and many roads coming together. The Germans had attacked it three or four times in an effort to keep supplies and reinforcements from reaching the 82nd Airborne Division in Nidmagen and the British 1st at Arnhem. The attacks had been partially successful. Blacker and blacker news reached us of the British 1st being ground to bloody rags by German panzers. Five or six miles south of Vegel, when we were down to ten minutes apiece on the machine gun, we passed through the village of St. Odin Road, where the Germans had also once cut the road. Several houses were smashed, and there was a dead British dispatch rider lying by the road in his leather gauntlets, knee-length boots and round helmet. The box of ammunition that I was carrying began to dig into my hand. Company headquarters had a car, I noticed, but they were too busy saving their own shoe leather to make room for others' necessities. Why don't we get a horse and wagon for this stuff? I said to Raider. The subject had been mentioned before, but I never wearied of discussing it. Peacock won't allow us to. God, you know Peacock. Boy, do I know Peacock. I shifted the box to the other hand. The head of the column left the road and began to go cross-country. In spite of the chill in the air, my underclothing was soaking wet, and my feet, swollen and throbbing, were burning hot. Finally, the order came to take a break. We fell out on the grass. Want some milk, Webb? Wiseman said, nodding at a cow grazing nearby. I sure do. Let's go. 
Tearing up handfuls of grass to feed her, we went to the cow and patted her and made our offering of food. As soon as she began to eat, Wiseman, who had done this many times before, squatted by her udder while I held my canteen cup below the chosen tits. An expert milkman, he filled the cup quickly. We stopped work and drank it down. The milk was warm and wonderfully rich and creamy. I had never tasted anything like it before I had come to Holland. Wiseman started to drain off another cupful. Let's go, Raider cried, moving out. We left the cow and continued west across slightly rolling land of poor farms, wild heath and small pine forests. After several hours, we stopped by one of these farms and had lunch. Wiseman and I beat the others through the kitchen door and quickly found a can of milk and cheese large enough for the whole squad. The house was bare and clean, but like all the other farms we had been in, alive with biting black flies that took the edge off the neatness. A further search outdoors uncovered half a dozen eggs in the dirty hay of an empty chicken coop. Delighted with our success, we built a fire in the backyard and scrambled the eggs in an iron skillet borrowed from the kitchen. We cleaned the skillet with sand and water when we were through and put it back in the kitchen. There was no sign of the owners anywhere. Well, I thought, as we set off again, in better spirits, if the deuce was in trouble when they called for help this morning, they'll be wiped out by the time we get there. I did not frankly look forward to best. Meandering around the countryside was far more pleasant than fighting. Mounting a small rise, we came upon a British infantry outfit dug into the westward slope. A company of the Queen's Own Guards Regiment, they were the neatest soldiers I had ever seen in action. Crouching in holes as square and precise as the Germans, they were all clean-shaven and in regulation uniform, with their helmets squarely on their heads. We knew that the guards' units were the best in the British Army, every man had to be at least six feet tall and a superior soldier, but we had never realised how well disciplined they were on the field of battle. By comparison, we looked like a rabble in arms, with our beards and muddy uniforms and tattered gear. Our helmets were worn with a jaunty individuality, and most of their tops had been blackened by cooking and shaving fires, for the helmet served as an all-purpose iron pot. The guards, who eyed us with the air of men studying a strange apparition, were, we noticed, on the alert and well down in their holes. What's up? somebody asked them. Jerry Tanks, an Englishman replied. He pointed west. In the low ground. The slightest elevation in a land as flat as Holland gave one command of a huge sweep of countryside. From here, at the crest of a sandy, gentle ridge, we could gaze west at least ten miles. I squinted down the slope at the meadows and patches of woods and saw no German tanks. That did not reassure me, for I knew the English did not lie like American soldiers. Everything was so still, and the guards, who had been in action since Normandy, and who yet looked as if they had just marched out of the sentry box at St James's Palace, were so tense and ready that I was glad when the order came to get going again. Heading north on a sandy road that ran along the top of the ridge, we began to hear the rumble of artillery ahead. The light chatter about the Queen's own died out. We entered a forest of the tallest pine trees we had seen so far. The slamming of many heavy doors came to us from the other side of the forest, where the 502 was fighting for best. The artillery accentuated the stillness of the woods. We seemed to be moving through silent sleep to a nightmare. A parachute was dangling from a tall pine fifty yards beyond the road, Two dead men from the 501 lay nearby. Farther along, brightly coloured plastic communications wire led to the scattered trenches of an abandoned German position. The artillery fire increased, and a sound of small arms began to mingle with the booming. I unslung my rifle and made sure that it was loaded. We emerged from the forest into lush meadowland. An 88 shell passed over, making us duck low as we filed into a deep ditch lined with huge old trees. The high steeple of a very old church stared down at us a quarter of a mile away. I wondered who was using it for observation. We crowded together and began to dig in. The order came to move to another place, only rice dug in there. With the dry rustling of many leaves our own artillery passed overhead, crashing to earth out of sight. The 88 fired again, lower than before, one, two, three. The shells burst in the battalion area and killed several men in the mortar platoon of headquarters company, but nobody in E company was hurt. The heavy tooming of a 50 caliber machine gun, 
answered a crackle of German fire. A lone sniper began to shoot into the meadow. After we had lain in fear and ignorance for at least thirty minutes, Sergeant Talbot came down the ditch from company headquarters and told us that it was a false alarm. The deuce has everything under control, he said. They don't need us after all. Thank God, I murmured. On your feet, men, he cried. We're going back to Uden. We stood up in full view of the steeple and filed slowly out of the ditch to a road through the forest behind us. This led in turn four or five miles to the Eindhoven Arnhem Highway. By now it was late afternoon. We had been on our feet almost continuously for twelve hours, and our feet hurt. Men who had once gone twenty minutes on the machine gun were down to two or three. Their griping warmed the air. Even Rice, who had tied his bootlaces tightly about his ankles so he wouldn't feel the pain as he carried a machine gun for F Company on the march from Tokoa to Atlanta, complained about the soreness and stiffness in his feet, ankles, and the calves of his legs. Thoroughly irritated, I finally wearied altogether of carrying my box of ammunition about the time we passed the dead motorcyclist in St. Oden Road. Jesus Christ, I said to Raider, why don't we give this goddamn ammo to company headquarters? They have a car. You know why. I jumped with this goddamn thing, and I've been stuck with it ever since. Tough. Let's get a goddamn car somewhere and use that. Can't. Peacock's orders. I'm not going to carry this thing much longer. Oh, hell, throw it away. We have plenty more. Throw away ammunition? Sure, we'll never miss it. Okay. I swung my arm back in an arc and let the box fly. It landed with a thud on the grass. But I couldn't enjoy it, because I had the worst diarrhoea I had ever caught in the army. I couldn't lie still for more than twenty minutes. Cramped and irritable, I had spent most of the day and night running back and forth to the slit trench latrine behind the barn, with time out for a mile walk to the medics and a dose of sulphur pills. It was all the cook's fault, I mused as I came in sight of our quarters. Rascals always were dirty. They kill a cow and butcher it and boil it hard in pasty gravy and call it beef stew. It almost broke my teeth, but the stew wasn't to blame it was the wash water afterward. Vile as the British seamen on the Samaria, who had set out cold pans of salt water for us to wash our mess kits in, they gave us a single garbage can of soapy water as a battalion rinse. By the time I got to the can, the scum was an inch thick on top. The grease clung to my pan, breeding germs, and gave me diarrhoea at the next meal. I had spent last night on the run, unable to enjoy the comforts of my sleeping bag. Well, anyway, I had voted. That made me happy. I had to walk almost two miles to cast my ballot, but I would have walked ten if necessary, because this was my first vote. I was twenty-two in June, and I had always wanted to cast it for Roosevelt, the greatest president we had ever had, and the only one who ever gave the working man a break. Roosevelt had faced and overcome the two great crises America had ever suffered the worst depression in history and the world's biggest war. He was a politician, as crafty and conniving as any, for politics is a cesspool of lying lawyers, but his work was greater than the man, and the country was better for it. The rich Republicans hated Roosevelt for helping the working man, for encouraging the labour unions to wring a fair day's wage for a fair day's work out of employers who had never heard of such a thing before, and for putting into effect fair employment practices that they considered outrageously socialistic. Roosevelt helped the unemployed when Herbert Hoover, the last Republican, an engineer who never quite understood humanity, had said, let every man help his brother. When he knew perfectly well that the rich weren't about to help the poor, never had and never would. I had grown up with Republicans and gone to school and college with them, and sickened by their selfishness, their cold avarice and lofty contempt for the common people had early sworn to vote for the Democrats, who, for all their rotten political faults, were more concerned with the welfare of the country as a whole. Delighted that one had at last fulfilled that ambition, I snapped back to the present when I saw a dozen people standing in front of our barn. A wild-eyed crone was shrieking and cackling at some soldiers while several Dutch children looked on. Was this loss? I said to the crone. She turned on me with a furious spate of Dutch that I could not follow. I shook my head at her. Ich verstehe nicht, I replied, spotting an intelligent-looking boy of about twelve who was watching us with a smile. I asked him what was going on. She says it's her barn, he replied in excellent German. 
The woman began to cry. Verrucht, the boy commented. She's nuts, I told the other GIs. The kid says she's nuts. We gathered that, Hubler said, chuckling. The woman wiped her face with her apron and turned on me with renewed fury, as if I were to blame. I backed away from her. Sick em, Ma, Pace cried. Es ist der Krieg, I said gently. Blaming everything on the war was an old excuse, but it sometimes worked. Krieg! Krieg! She yelled, throwing up her hands. Hubler grinned. Tell her we're sorry, but we have to stay in the barn for a while, I said to the boy. We'll take good care of it. He translated the message and got back a hag's curse in reply. We won't hurt anything, I added, but the crone was adamant. We were in her barn, she shrieked, and we had to get out of it. Oh, hell, I sighed, beginning to lose patience. Tell her to go home. This only brought more tears. I reached in my pocket, pulled out a D-ration chocolate bar and handed it to her. Here, for Chris's sake. The crying stopped and her eyes brightened. Danke, danke, she murmured. I hurried into the barn. She began to wail again, but her audience drifted away, and so she finally gave up and shuffled home, talking to herself. The sun went down, and soon the barn was filled with snores. Carl Sawosko, a quiet, pleasant man from Chicago who had joined E Company, lit a candle and put it on the floor near the door, then got his guitar, which had come up with the sleeping bags, and began to play. Hubler and the first squads Dukeman and Christensen, who were both good singers, gathered around. A barrage rumbled in the west as they sang. Now where? I muttered as we marched toward a convoy of GI trucks. I was in an irritable mood, for the diarrhoea had tied my stomach in hard knots, sucked my throat dry and galled my arms. The raw chafing made me take short steps and wince with pain. My views on life were more jaundiced than usual, and when Peacock told us that we were going north of Nijmegen to hold a quiet defensive position, I could not help commenting sourly that I had heard that song before. Incredibly garbled in transit, the word had finally reached us that the British had lost the battle for Arnhem.